Hare Krishna. So thank you very much for coming today evening and I'll speak on the topic of from insecurity to inner security. Am I audible to everyone behind? Yes. Is it do we need to make it louder or is it clear? Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. So today it's a sobering occasion because we are also observing or honoring two departed souls. As was mentioned, Elisha Johnson Elsa Johnson and Sri Hari Prabhu. And when some people who have been with us for a long time, suddenly they depart from the world, especially when that departure is untimely and sudden, that can lead to a sense of shock, agony, fear, disbelief, a variety of emotions which jolt us out of the routine of our life. So this topic will try to contemplate and understand the nature of the world while also offering our prayers for the spiritual security of the departed souls. So I'll speak this in three points and after each point I'll have a pause where I'll invite you to do some reflections, any point that struck you which you would like to carry home or meditate or apply or share with others can reflect that, that way we can assimilate it more. So the three points I'll speak is that our longing for security points to our spirituality. That will be the first point. The second point will be the illusion of security is often the greatest enemy of security. And the third point will be that see all security as coming from Krishna and pointing to Krishna. So let's look at this. First point is that our longing for security points to our spirituality. We all long for security. Now, if, say, if we are traveling in a boat and suddenly the boat starts very too much. We need to try to find something to hold on to. Because that's insecure. Now just as a turbulent ocean can create insecurity for our footing, similarly there can be different kinds of insecurities. If we have a particular relationship with someone and suddenly that person behaves in a very unexpected way, then we feel insecure because of that. So now whenever we feel insecure, Say a child is playing, and the child a sudden lightning, and the lightning and thunder comes, and the child runs to the mother and catches the mother's foot and covers the face over there. Why? Because that sudden noise and light causes fear, even terror for the child. The child wants security, and the mother is the source of security of safety for the child. The child runs to the mother. So we all long for security and we could say that this is just natural because we are all driven by a survival instinct. We all want to survive and security or our danger or insecurity is like a threat to our survival. That is true definitely but we could take this question a little deeper and ask we don't just why do we want to survive? And it's not just that we want to survive, we actually want to survive for long, in fact forever. If we see death jolts us because of its suddenness, also because of its utter unappealability. If say it's a court case and the court, we are involved in the court case and the court gives a decision against us, we can always appeal to a higher court. But death, it has a finality that is utterly unappealable. So, now if we look at the world around us, every single thing is destructible. 
absolutely nothing lasts forever even huge mountain ranges india has the mount everest the world's highest peak even something as magnificent gigantic as that when that is not going to last forever it was just a few months ago in new york in america and we passed by the area where the twin towers had been there when the twin towers fell it was not just the falling of a building it was the smashing and collapsing of the of the symbol of western security and prosperity and that created a permanent scar on the american psyche not just the american psyche you could say uh, the world psyche at large especially the western world psyche so now if we, the point i'm making here is we have a very deep longing for security to live and to live forever to go on and on living but if we look at the world around us whether it is natural things like mountains or imposing man made things like twin towers nothing lasts forever so if we were simply material creatures if we are simply products of the world around us then nothing lasts forever why would we have a desire to live forever if we were simply products of our circumstances products of the matter that makes our bodies and that makes our world matter by its very nature is temporary why would we have a longing to live forever this longing is as out of place as say if somebody comes to a house and suddenly they see a gold ring fallen on the ground now if you look okay the floor is made up of tiles the walls are made up of stone concrete but there's nothing golden over here so as soon as we see something golden say, where did this come from it doesn't fit into the in surrounding the environment the setting so it's as out of place as that or to give another example say for child in a remote say australian native australian community completely disconnected from the world having no internet no television no phones a child suddenly one day approaches his mom and says mom i want a pizza 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 what the mother you ask me where did you hear about a pizza there's nothing in the environment of the child to give him even the idea of a pizza so similarly if we look at the world around us there is nothing that lasts forever and yet we long for security by which we can live forever so where does our longing come from this longing is not to be fulfilled or even manifested at the material level of reality so a reasonable inference could be that this points to something non material that there is within us a non material core and that lasts forever that is imperishable indestructible invincible and that core is who we are and that our longing for security comes from our spiritual core our spirituality so we could make a reasonable inference like this and because the spiritual arena is not perceivable by our senses it's by definition non material so we need a appropriate source of knowledge for it and that is there are there are ancient wisdom test texts 
which are considered traditionally as revelations coming from a higher source. And some people feel that I want to be reasonable, I want to be rational. I I want to I don't want to believe in basically on faith. That's that's good. We can use our reason. But reason and revelation both can point in the same direction. So what so reason is like a torchlight. Our rational faculty is like a torchlight. And it can show dimly in the dark the territory ahead of us. So what reason shows dimly as a torchlight, revelation shows clearly as a sunlight. So both reason and revelation illumine the same territory, same reality to different degrees. So the Bhagavad Gita is one such revelation. And it explains what is the spirituality that is the source of our longing for security. It explains that we are souls. The soul is by nature eternal. And the soul is a part of the supreme eternal being. That is God. Who is known by different names in different traditions. The Bhagavad Gita knows that divine, that ultimate reality by the name Krishna. Which means all attractive. Sarva Akarshiti Iti Krishna. So, life is a journey for the for us, finite souls, to unite with the infinite soul. And we are all on a multi-life journey of spiritual evolution, evolving in consciousness, till we realize our spirituality, till we realize our eternality, and then we reunite in love with our source, with the whole, with God. So this is the ultimate purpose of life. And in this multi-life evolutionary journey, each lifetime is like one phase. If we are going on a marathon, in a marathon run, there are many laps. One lap, second lap, third lap, fourth lap. And the marathon keeps going on. So similarly, we are like on a spiritual marathon. And each life is like one lap, one phase in that marathon. And we keep moving forward. So in this vision, death is not a full stop. Death is a comma. Death is not a termination, it is a transition. It is a transition to another level of reality. Where the soul's evolution will continue. And thus... Death does not end a, a person's existence. Then death it just takes the person's existence to another level where the evolution will continue. So this was the first point that our longing for spirit, uh, longing for security, points to our spirituality. So any reflections or questions on this point? Yes. You have that we are all eternal beings, but then you said also the finite is connected to infinite. What does finite mean? Okay. Good question. So we are eternal beings, but among the eternal also there are different levels. We are eternal means in time we exist forever. But there is pervasion in time and that's pervasion in space. So we are eternal in the sense that we pervade, our existence pervades across time. But across space, we are finite beings. So each one of us is a finite soul. So as a presently our consciousness pervades across the body. So if right now you may be feeling hot or cold, I can't perceive that. But you, the soul inside your body can perceive it. So, similar, so, whereas God or the ultimate reality is the infinite soul. That means that infinite per pervades across time is eternal but also pervades across space. 
So God pervades all of existence. That is one of his defining characteristics. He is omnipresent. So we need to connect with him by our consciousness. So God is present right now also with us in our hearts. But we are not aware of his presence. So as our consciousness becomes more and more attuned to his presence, then we connect with him. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. So, what was the first point I just made? Points to our? Yes, yeah, points to our spirituality. Thank you. So now, the second point I'll make is the illusion of security is often the greatest enemy of security. Now, what do I mean by the illusion of security? <clears throat> Suppose, say, an army is defending a fort or a city or a country and then there is an invading army that is coming. But the invading army seems to be coming but then they divert and they go away. And when the enemy goes away, the defending soldiers think that we are safe. But if that is simply a stratagem and the enemy has gone in another direction and suddenly they come charging in and they catch the defending army unawares. So if the defending army thinks I am secure, then that illusion of security is the greatest danger to their security. One of my friends in India is in the anti-terrorism squad. Some of you have heard that in India there was a big terrorist attack in Kashmir and that has brought the conflict between India and Pakistan to a boiling point now. So, so this friend was telling me that working in the security, working in especially anti-terrorism is like being a goalkeeper in football. No matter how many goals you save, people remember the goal that you couldn't save. <laughs> so what happens is, no matter how many terrorist attacks they foil, if one goes through, that's what people remember. So he was telling me that actually what we need for vigilance and security, vigilance against terrorism is that not just that we increase more and more the number of anti-terrorist personnel, but also that ordinary citizens also become more vigilant. If they see anything suspicious, they immediately alert us. So when we think that we are secure, then we lower our guard. And when we lower our guard, that's when danger comes in. So, so now why am I talking about this point in this context? The previous point was that we are all longing for security. And the security is to be found at the spiritual level where we realize our eternality and we relish our connection with the supreme eternal reality. That is God. In the last few centuries, we, the world has seen an enormous amount of material progress. And this material progress has transformed our lived experience of the world. Especially through technology, we experience the kind of comforts that were not available even for royalty a few hundred years ago. Even kings couldn't imagine turning on a button and just becoming protected from the vagaries of the weather. It's hot, suddenly become, make your house cool. It's cool. It's cold, make your house warm. Or just press a few buttons and call, connect with anyone in any part of the world. So because of technological progress and because of the comfort that technology has brought to our life, one thing that has happened is that we have started getting more and more an illusion of security. In fact, there's one social critic who said that technology is the art of arranging reality 
so that we don't experience reality. <laughs> Technology is the art of arranging reality. So it may be very hot, but we create an air-conditioned environment so that we don't experience the heat at all. So now, this is not a bad thing. It's not that if it's hot, we should be tormented by the heat. But it is just that if we live in denial of reality, if we live in ignorance of reality, then when reality intrudes into our life, it could come as a sudden shock. So, <clears throat> because of technological progress, we to some extent have started living more and more in denial of the reality of death. <laughs> now, any one of you ask, are you going to die? Of course, we won't ask anyone like that, generally. <laughs> but if we ask anyone, are you going to die? Nobody will say no. Everyone will say, yes, I'm going to die. But we talk about it in such a remote and abstract sense as if the death is an event going to happen to someone else. Someone else at some other time. There's a, there's a well-known Western, Western thinker, American thinker. He read Indian literature and he read Indian spiritual literature, Buddhism, Hinduism. And he said, why are these Indians so pessimistic? They always talk about how the world is a place of distress. <laughs> Life is enjoyable. Why, is, why, is, why are they so negative? But then he came to India and he saw it the Indian metros, you know, the metro capacity, one coach has 50 capacity and there are 300 people in it. <laughs> then I said, yes, the world is full of distress. <laughs> so now, distress is there everywhere in the world. But when there is a lot of technological, adva technological advancement and comfort with it, then the, the awareness of distress and death gets numbed. Now, of course, it's, we all, in a sense, encounter death through the entertainment industry. In movies, in novels, in video games. Death is very much present. But there, the focus is so much on entertainment that rather than focusing on death, we focus on death simply as a plot twist in the entertainment. So death becomes incorporated as an element of entertainment. In fact, there is in the Bhagavad Gita the concept of reincarnation, where the soul goes from this body into another body. And much of the Indian movie industry, just like in the West, there's Hollywood, India has Bollywood, yes. It's in Mumbai, so it's called, it's Bombay, it was Bollywood. So Bollywood, many movies have this theme of, they, they many of the movies are based on romance, and in romance, they integrate reincarnation. So a hero and, hero, a hero and heroine are trying to unite, and they have a lot of opposition, and both of them die. And then both of them are born exactly looking the same. And then they continue their romance from the previous life. <laughs> so in fact, I have written a book on reincarnation. So when I speak in colleges in the Western world, uh, I mean, in, especially on the topic of reincarnation, one common question that many young people ask is, do we all have soulmates? Do we have, all have soulmates? So, I often say that, let's focus on the soul first, not on the mate. <laughs> let's focus on the soul. So that there is something eternal that is important to understand. Like that one boy asked me a question, he said that this is a girl I want to marry, but somehow our parents are not agreeing. So it's just not working out. So can you please tell me, what karma I can do now by which I can marry her in my next life? 
so even the awareness of death what has happened it has become co-opted as just a plot twist in entertainment or in romance or whatever else like that so we talk frequently about death without actually ever even thinking about death we talk about death in the sense of as an entertainment plot twister but without actually contemplating on the reality of death and now the result of this is that when death comes up in our life we just jolted what is how did this happen where did this come from and this so the security we are souls living in a material level of reality security is to be found at the spiritual level but as long as we think that the material level of life is comfortable is wonderful that takes away all our impetus to explore life spiritual side and thus the illusion of security actually no matter how much technological advancement we can make we may make ultimately we can't stop death death is something which every single person has to go through sooner or later but the idea that okay death is something long time ahead so that thing it deters us it destimulates us from exploring our spiritual side and thus we stay in illusion the illusion of security acts as the enemy of security how the enemy because we will find security ultimately at the spiritual level but by thinking that i am secure here we lose the impetus to explore life spiritual side and and this is not just at a individual level this has happened also at a broader social and global level now if we could can if we could separate historical ages now there is the pre modern age which was before the scientific revolution and then the technological juggernaut started off then there was the modern age and now we live in what people call as a post modern age so a defining difference between the pre modern age and the modern age is the many differences we could say technology came up came on its own science developed all that is true but in terms of world views whether you look in the in europe or in australia or in india or in america or in russia people everywhere there had an understanding that there is another world beyond this world and that world is life's ultimate purpose that world is the world where there is security that the world is the place where there is uh, that is our ultimate destination jesus famously said that this world is like a bridge don't build your house on it cross over the bridge and similar passages can be found in various world traditions so the defining difference between the pre modern age and the modern age is that in the modern was that in the modern age the idea of some other world was rejected there is some other world which is a paradise forget it we with our science and technology we will make this world into paradise why do you need a spiritual paradise when we will make a technological paradise over here and now certainly technology has advanced and there's nothing uh, technology is very powerful and technology can be extremely useful but if technology if we start believing that by technology we can eliminate death if we can change the fundamental fabric or nature of the world that is an illusion so spirituality became something which just receded into people's background in their mind and just went out of their mental space because all their hopes became pinned on this world and thus 
we live in a situation where we think this world is the only real world. This world is the only world that matters. And <clears throat> therefore, when something terrible happens in this world, when suddenly death occurs, it just jolts us. So the illusion of security, the illusion that we can make this world into paradise is the greatest enemy of our pursuit of spirituality. So the illusion of security can be the greatest enemy of real security. That is the second point I was going to speak. So any reflections or comments or questions on this? Yes, please. Uh, uh, I'm new here. Uh, thank you. So, I have a question about the topic of security and insecurity. The word you said are really profound. Sometimes, in fact, I think I was looking for that, that kind of answer. So, you might discuss it later, but it's a question that how we can allay the fear of security, how we can come out of illusion. And once we come out of it, how do we can? Uh, show part to other people, I will ask family members and friends to come out of insecurity. Okay. What is the way? Very good question. In fact, my last point will be discussing about that. So, I'll come to that. Thank you for that question. Any other points of reflection or questions based on what I just discussed? Yes, please. Uh, we are in this material world, which is full of misery. We are fallen in this material world, gone to the spiritual world, and we are bound to face all these you know, difficulties, miseries in this world. We have to go through this. Yeah. Can we avoid this? Can we avoid, avoid this? No? This is what my question is. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Now, can we avoid the distresses in this world when we are here? There are certain amount of distresses that are unavoidable. When we say that this world is a place of distress, the Bhagavad Gita, for example, uses the word Dukkhalayam. That this is a place of Dukkha, of distress. What does it mean? It has to be carefully understood. If we see the Bhagavad Gita was spoken to Arjun, and Arjun was so distressed at the start of the Gita that he was crying. Publicly, so he was a fierce warrior. The you could say the embodiment of manliness and virility, and yet he was so distressed that in public, without any sense of shame or anything, he was crying. And Krishna didn't tell him, "Oh, this world is place of distress. You are distressed. Now stay distressed." No, Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita's message by which. His distress went away. He became pacified. By the end of the Gita, he was peaceful. Because peaceful now. So the point here is that there are distresses are unavoidable in the world. But our actions can aggravate those distresses. Or our actions can contribute to the minimization and ultimately the elimination of distress. So an example to illustrate this would be that when we say the world is a place of distress. See, distress is a feature of the world. Distress is not the purpose of the world. It's not that this world is created to give us distress. Rather, existence in this world is characterized by distress. In that sense, the world is like a hospital. Anybody is in a hospital who is in a hospital will have some distress. But the hospital is not a torture center meant to cause pain to the inmates. So the distress, just as, just as pain is, a, is present in the uh, hospital, but pain is not the intent of the hospital. So similarly, distress is not the intent of the world. And to the extent the patient 
to the extent the patient takes the treatment properly to that extent the pain can be managed and even the disease can be healed so similarly to the extent we live in a spiritually harmonious way which is like a treatment for us to that extent whatever pain we are whatever distresses we are going to go through they can be minimized okay thank you so that brings me to the last point at last point was that see all security as coming from krishna and pointing to krishna so the flow is that first point i said we long for security and that points to our spirituality but however in today's world we look for security at the material level through technological advancement through comfort through material progress but that is an illusion and that illusion because it deters us distracts us from spiritual growth so it is actually the enemy of our spiritual enemy of real security now when we are in the world obviously we seek security in different ways so if say we come to know that there is some infectious germ spreading in the area where we are living and the doctors advise take this antibiotic or take this immunity enhancer then we will take that because that will give us physical or medical security so while existing in the world we need various kinds of securities even at the material level and we seek those securities and try to get them as much as possible but we don't see that security as separate from krishna see all security as coming from krishna in the sense that that everything that provides us security it is ultimately god's blessing in our life it is god who is providing us security and this vision we can have right from birth itself when a child is born at that time when an infant is born the first life sustaining activity for that infant is that the infant is picked up by the mother and the mother offers breast milk to the, uh, the infant and the mother naturally feels a great love for her child this is wonderful it is at the same time if we think deeply the mother did not do anything special to inject her breasts with milk when the baby was coming the same divine arrangement that sent a baby through the belly of the mother into the world that's to the womb of the mother into the world that same divine arrangement also provided for milk through the breast of the mother so yes the mother is definitely a source of security for the baby but the mother is not a independent source of security the mother is able to give security of providing life sustaining milk because god has arranged through nature for her breast to secrete milk at that time so see all security as coming from krishna so everything that gives us security in this world when while it gives us security it is valuable and even vital so even technology if technology works now then we can see the whatever facility comfort security technology is providing us we can see that, that is also coming from krishna it is krishna who is the source of the intelligence of everyone and the scientists who work hard the technologists who work hard to develop this technology it is krishna who gave them that intelligence they work hard to use that intelligence and thus the security is there so if we are sick now we are sitting here in the house of dauji prabhu he is a doctor and he works tirelessly to provide medical care to devotees and people in general now he sees his medical skills his medical ability as a gift from krishna so he provides security but how is it it is by god's grace i was in a hospital which has a spiritual care unit quite active and they had a slogan over there we treat he heals now we treat 
he heals as doctors they offer the treatment but the healing is not in the hands of the doctors alone sometimes the doctors may offer the best treatment but sometimes the doctor the, the healing may not work i have a friend who has a uh, severe liver liver issues and there's particular chemical you know, it has to be like a, around 5 to 10 is the level in his body it is 300 and the doctor told him you are going to die in 6 months and the doctor told that to him 15 years ago and after telling that to him the doctor died in 3 years <laughs> but he is still alive <laughs> so that there is definitely a, his, his doctor said that it's a medical miracle how he is alive so so there's definitely the medical treatment is important but it alone is not all defining it alone doesn't determine life and death so if we see and seek security in the world if we may do exercise to have good health we may work and earn and save to have financial security we may try to have good good relationships good community so that we can have social uh, social support now all these forms of security at a practical level are needed now we can see them as independent from god and depend only on them or we can see them as coming from god and we can connect we can appreciate what whoever is doing for us but we can also connect with krishna and shri prabhupad the founder acharya of the krishna consciousness movement was going to america he was 69 years old he had never even gone out of india and he was going on a cargo ship all alone to a land where he didn't know anyone he didn't even know whether he was a pure vegetarian he didn't even know whether vegetarian food would be available in america or not so he took some stock of vegetables and grains with him and then his sponsor she was a pious lady sin uh, sindhya a steamship company owner and she knew that swami ji was a vegetarian so she told her captain of the ship that you arrange for a good stock of vegetables and grains and prabhupad wrote his diary his journal during his travels and there he writes a very beautiful endearing statement he says that thanks to lord krishna for enlightening uh, miss sindhya from within her heart to provide all these nice food for me so is acknowledging that it is coming from her but is also acknowledging that it is krishna who guided her to do this so when we see security we can appreciate when it is coming from where it is coming at the material level but we also see that that is not the ultimate source the ultimate source is krishna so whatever whoever is doing for us it is ultimately krishna doing for us through them so when we see that all security is coming from krishna then we won't get into illusion thinking that okay i have the security i don't need anything more because it is coming from krishna and sometimes the person who is giving the security despite their best intentions tomorrow they may not be able to provide security we might work for a very good boss i was speaking recently in a company i think i might be working for a very good boss and the audience started laughing I said what happened so it's good boss is a oxymoron this <laughs> good boss is basically opposite ideas coming together <laughs> but anyway even we might be working for a very good boss but and the boss might pay us well well but tomorrow if the industry if the economy goes down that boss has to lay us off that boss cannot provide us financial security to work, even if they want to so if we see security as coming only from that horizontal source then when it doesn't come we'll just be shocked but if we see that the security they are not the source they are the channel 
and it's krishna who is providing you that security and suppose that that security stops from that source from that intermediate channel then we focus on krishna we connect with krishna ultimately uh, the horizontal security the material security that we are that we get the material security is is not meant to make us settle down in the world like i quoted the bible the world is like a bridge don't build your home on this cross over it so material security is meant for us to peacefully focus on our spiritual journey not to settle in material life itself thinking this is this is perfection of my life so that's why I see material security as pointing see all security as pointing to krishna okay now i have got the security now my health is good let me try to understand what is the purpose of life let me try to connect more with krishna let me try to practice bhakti for connecting with krishna so going back to the hospital example i gave earlier if a patient is sick and is in pain then the doctor gives two kinds of medications an antiseptic and an analgesic antiseptic is the curative medicine the analgesic is the pain medicine now the pain medicine helps the patient to get relieved from the pain and the antiseptic it cures the patient of the underlying disease that is the cause of the pain from the doctor's perspective among these two which is most important which one the antiseptic because that is going to be really cure the patient but from the patient's perspective which seems the most beneficial the pain medication the analgesic so so we can say that in this world god provides us both see our material security is like the analgesic and the spiritual process of bhakti the spiritual security is like the antiseptic it is the process of bhakti that will actually cure us of our disconnection with krishna and it will help us to attain krishna so now from krishna's perspective it is the process of bhakti that is the most important that is what will take us to him but from our perspective we feel this material security is most important and if that is lost we feel everything is lost but yes it is important when pain is there pain is to put it tautologically pain is painful nobody wants pain so if we consider say if it's very hot if it's very cold it's it's annoying it's, it can be painful also. if we are hungry and we don't have food it's painful if we are thirsty and there's no water it's painful at the same time say if we are hungry and we get food food is a vital necessity at the same time food is like a pain killer after 5 6 hours again we are going to feel hungry after another 5 6 hours again we are going to feel hungry now food this is not to minimize the importance of food but it's also we can't ultimatize it we can't think this is the ultimate thing so our material needs and the material security that provides us those material needs that is basically like a analgesic that is basically like a pain medication it's important but it's not all important whereas our spiritual practice is like the antiseptic it is a curative medicine and sometimes if the pain medication stops the patient is starts screaming i'm in so much pain and the other other patients over there or the relatives of the patient may say hey, what are you doing doctor the patient is in so much pain but from the doctor's perspective yes doctor doesn't doctor also doesn't want the patient to be in pain but from the doctor's perspective if the curative the antiseptic is going on the the patient is on the path to recovery is on the path to recovery so the patient needs to see that both the analgesic and the antiseptic are coming from the doctor and suppose 
the patient starts thinking, actually, this analgesic is quite cheap. This antiseptic is so expensive. And I take the antiseptic and nothing happens. I take the analgesic and I feel so much relief. So why do I need to take this antiseptic? And the patient starts taking only the analgesic. Then the patient is cheating oneself. Because internally the disease is worsening. So that is what happened in today's society. That we are so infatuated with material progress. That we have completely neglected life's spiritual side. So we are focusing on the analysis and we are trying to increase the dosages. Get more and more and more and more. But it's a painkiller. Many times nowadays, young people, they are so busy. You know, just playing video games, surfing on the net, watching some movies. And there's one, I was in Chicago and I was talking with one young boy who was singing. And he said, I can't imagine how people in previous generations lived without video games. <laughs> Their life must have been so boring. So I told him, and actually, it is because your life is so boring that you feel the need for video games. <laughs> it is, what has happened is that we have become so spiritually empty, so spiritually deadened that we obsessively need entertainment. Entertainment is simply like a painkiller. It's, we could say, an emotional or psychological or a mental, mental painkiller. And entertainment has always been a part of human society. But the kind of obsession with entertainment that we see in today's world, it's unheard of in human history. In a few days in India, the Indian Premier League, which is a major cricket tournament, will start. And in this IPL, is cricket players, they earn 50 days what 95% of Indians don't earn in 50 years. Astronomical sums of money. And why, where is that money coming from? It's coming from people. And why are people providing so much money? Because they desperately feel the need for entertainment. So if entertainment is a painkiller and people desperately need entertainment, that means the disease has become so much that you just can't tolerate the absence of the painkiller even for a short time. So basically, this is the direction where the disease is worsening and we are not actually becoming secure or satisfied, we are simply going into illusion. But if you see all security as coming from Krishna, even if somebody seeks entertainment, like we had now these wonderful kirtans sung by all these young devotees, all these devotees together. Now this is also an entertainment. It is uplifting, but it takes us towards Krishna. It is about Krishna, it takes us towards Krishna. So if we see all security as coming from Krishna, and is taking us towards Krishna. Then sometimes, if some security suddenly stops, say if suddenly somebody's health breaks down, suddenly somebody loses a job, or at a more extreme level, suddenly somebody loses their life. All that has happened from the ultimate spiritual perspective is that one analgesic has suddenly been stopped. But the treatment is still going on. And the soul can still evolve spiritually. So for all of us, we are on this journey of spiritual evolution. And to the extent we stay focused on that journey, to that extent we can experience security in a way that takes us towards the supreme security. So how do we experience that spiritual security? We seek material security through our jobs, through our families, through our social circles, and that's fine. But we try to connect, see all that security is coming from Krishna. And to point towards Krishna, to connect with Krishna, we practice Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga is the process by which we, our consciousness comes in contact with Krishna. It, 
Bhakti Paresha Anubhava. Bhakti is the process which gives us Anubhava, experience of Krishna. So when we chant Hare Krishna, when we worship Krishna, when we hear about Krishna, at that time, the more we get absorbed in it, the more we'll experience relief, the more we'll experience shelter, the more we'll experience strength. Madashraya katha amrishta shrunvanti katha yanti cha tapanti vividha stapa naitan madgata chet saha So Krishna says that when we become absorbed in Him, the distresses of the world will hit us. But they won't hurt us. Life's problems will still come. But if we are not obsessing on those problems, they won't trouble us that much. Many times when problems come in our life, it is, I'll conclude with this point, that when problems come in our life, it is not just the problem that troubles us. It is the way we think about the problem or keep obsessing over the problem that troubles us. Life determines our problems, but we determine the size of the problems. Life determines the problems in our life. Life determines our problems, but we determine the size of those problems. What do I mean by the size? Say, if we go for a get together and somebody, we greet somebody and that person snubs us. Majorly, we get so angry and a snub might happen in 10 seconds but next 10 hours we are burning internally how dare this person do like this so now yes if that person snubbed us that's, 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 dis, that's annoying that's distressing but do we have to keep your keep vegetating on it burning because of it for 10 hours not needed. But what happens? Our mind <coughs> seems to be like an iron filing that is attracted to the magnet of problems. <laughs> so, whenever any problem comes in our life, that problem becomes like a magnet and our mind becomes like an iron filing. It just gets attracted. It keeps thinking about the problem again and again and again and again, on and on and on. And if we consider, say, a graph of problems versus time. Now, if we have a problem and we don't think about the problem at all, that is also a problem. Isn't it? If I have if I'm sick, if I've got if I got diabetes or I got some issue and I don't think about it at all, then I won't go to a doctor, I won't take the treatment, I won't uh, avoid the prohibited foods, I may not do the exercise. So uh, if we consider this is the problem and this is time. Initially, the graph moves linearly up. That means the more we think about the problem, the more equipped we become to deal with the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the problem. This is the medicine I have to take. This is what I have to avoid. This is the exercise I have to do. Think about it. My capacity to deal with the problem increases. However, this graph doesn't keep going straight linearly. After some time, it flattens out. Sometimes we keep thinking about a problem and there's no solution that comes. Say, like, oh, why did I get this diabetes? Maybe I ate that at a time. Maybe that happened. Maybe it's in my genes. Maybe diabetes is not infectious. So how did that person give me diabetes? You know, what happened? Just keep thinking. It doesn't lead to any help if you keep thinking about it. And after some time, this graph goes down. That means the more we think about the problem, the less becomes our capacity to deal with it. Because we become so overwhelmed by it. Say, if we suddenly lose a job, lose our job, then, okay, we have to think. Okay, what do I do now? Okay, I have this financial security right now and this is my qualification. This is where I can apply for a job. This is what I can do. This is what I can do. But after that, I keep thinking about, it. oh, I lost my job, I lost my job, I lost my job. Then, that doesn't really lead to any solution. If somebody has lost a job and they want to find a job, okay, you treat finding a job like a full-time job. You know, okay, maybe six, seven, eight hours, just work full time to get a new job. But no need to keep worrying about it 24 hours a day. No need to make your own life miserable and make everyone else's life miserable. Hmm? After some time, this graph just goes down. The more we think about the problem, the more we become overwhelmed by the problem. Our mind seems going, keeps going round and round and round and round. 
is a fan here and the fan goes round it cools us down but when our mind goes round it heats us up <laughs> it heats us up so that way that's what i mean when life determines our problems but we determine the size of those problems if you keep thinking about the problem the problem starts becoming bigger and bigger and bigger but if we think as much as is necessary to deal with the problem constructively and afterwards we think of krishna we focus on krishna we connect with krishna and krishna can act as a inner secure place for our mind so we all need some satisfying pacifying secure object of thought we need something to think about which will make us peaceful which will make us joyful and krishna is that object the more we think about krishna the more we become peaceful the more we feel com com we feel a sublime sense of peace and serenity coming up within us and then that empowers us not only to keep moving to keep moving forward towards krishna but also to work to a, in the best possible way to get whatever material security that was lost so there's a problem that means the material security was lost we can work to get that as much as is possible and at the same time we can keep moving towards krishna so when we see all problems as come as all security as coming from krishna and pointing towards krishna then we can become deepened in our krishna consciousness and when we are krishna conscious even amidst problems we can have security we can have there is release from problems and there is relief amidst problems there is release from problems means the problem goes away but relief amidst problems means the problem is there but if we don't keep thinking about it again and again and again that itself gives us relief even when the problem is there it's like it's extremely hot outside release from the heat means the season changes and it becomes cool but relief amidst the problem means that we come to a nicely air conditioned room we feel relief so thinking about krishna focusing on krishna is like coming into the air conditioned room when we come in there we get the relief we get the relief amidst the problem also even if the problem is not gone and in due course the problem will go away life will go on life will be bad right now things will become better in due course but if we have connected with krishna that means that we will stay on the most auspicious course in our life so krishna is our ultimate security and we all may face different problems in our life but as long as we are connected with krishna we will be led towards the supreme security we will find security in krishna in this life as well as beyond this life eternally so i'll summarize i spoke on the topic of from insecurity to inner security so i spoke three points the first point was that our longing for security points to our spirituality we all want security by which you can live on forever but nothing either natural or man made lasts forever where does our then where does our desire to live forever securely come from it's as out of place as a gold ring in a stone building or as a remote afric remote tribal child wanting a pizza so it does this longing for life eternal doesn't come from our externals it comes from our non material core that is the soul and what reason this we can this is a reasonable inference and what reason reveals dimly like a torch light the revelation reveals clearly like the sunlight so the bhagavad gita is a revelation which tells us about the spiritual level of reality we are souls the finite eternal beings and there is the infinite eternal being it's god krishna and we are on a multi life journey of spiritual evolution to reconnect with krishna in love and in this multi life journey death is not a full stop but a comma and we can keep moving forwards in life 
and in death on this evolutionary journey. And the second, this was the first point. Second point was the illusion of security is often the greatest enemy of security. I talked about how we in today's world, because all death is just a fact of life, but we often live in denial of death because technology has provided us so much comfort that we, when we talk about death also, we talk about it as happening to someone else or happening in a very distant time. And in entertainment, we co-opt death as a plot twist, so, but not as something which is going to happen to us. And in the in these modern times, or from the modern, modern time onwards, people in general have replaced the spiritual paradise with a technological paradise. And that's why all our hopes are pinned on this world alone. And that's why we no longer seek security by growing spiritual. And that's how the illusion you know, security, because at the material level, we cannot avoid death or distress ultimately. So that illusion that we can do so is the greatest enemy of seeking spirituality, security at the spiritual level. And the last point was that see all security as coming from Krishna and pointing towards Krishna. So when a newborn infant gets to the security of the mother's lap and the mother's milk, that is the mother giving, but not just the mother giving. It is Krishna giving through the mother. When a doctor treats us and gives us medication, it is the doctor treating us, but it is Krishna healing us through the doctor. So when we see all security as coming from Krishna, then if some security stops coming, we don't become shocked or dis, 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 devastated, but we stop looking at that source, or look, that channel alone and look towards the source. And I give the example, the world is like a hospital and we are all patients. And material security is like the analgesic, is the pain medication. And the spiritual security that comes by connecting with Krishna, by becoming absorbed in Krishna is like the antiseptic, the curative medicine. And the, from the doc patient's perspective, it is the pain medicine that is most important. But from the doctor's perspective, it is the curative medicine that is the most important. So what we consider as insecurity is, some, is the loss of the pain medication. But sometimes when that pain medication is lost, that is the time when we can fully focus on the curative cur cur medication alone. So when we lose material security, instead of just becoming disheartened or disoriented, we can focus on connecting with Krishna. And in that connection with Krishna, in that absorption of Krishna through Bhakti, we can experience relief, relief amidst distress, even if we don't immediately express, immediately experience release from distress. And I talked about how, how do we experience this relief? That Krishna acts like a satisfying object of thought for us. Satisfying, pacifying object of thought. And today the pain medication, the pain has become so great that people need more and more intense doses of pain medication. Uh, one example of this is the hyper up, uh, hyper up uh, obsession with entertainment. And when we connect with Krishna, then our mind becomes gets a satisfying object of thought, and thus it doesn't obsess over the problems that we have, and that itself provides us relief. When we have problems, often our mind becomes like an iron filing, rushing towards the magnet of the problems and obsessing over it. So, if you consider time versus problems, if we think about a problem, initially our capacity to deal with it improves, we become more equipped. But if we keep thinking about it, we just vegetate on it. And after we keep thinking about it, we become overwhelmed by it. So, we think about a problem adequately, but don't vegetate on it. So, life determines our problems, we determine their size. And if we have Krishna in our life, we focus on Krishna, we connect with Krishna, then we won't exaggerate, we won't aggravate the size of the problems, but we'll deal with them constructively. By connecting with Krishna, we experience the spiritual security, like coming into an air-conditioned room amidst summer. And we also get the inner calmness and clarity by which we can best seek whatever material security is possible. 
So if we stay connected with Krishna, that is the way to security in this world as well as beyond. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.